Are we ready? We're good. Okay. Welcome everyone to the final public event of the Ruskin Art Club's fall 2021 season. We'll take a short break uh, for the holidays and be back for the winter season starting on Thursday, January 6th with a lecture by author Damien Searles on Proust, translator of John Ruskin. Thank you all for your support during this past year and we look forward to seeing you next year. I'll turn the reins now over to our executive director, Dave Meyer. Thank you, Eric. Uh, this is, as Eric mentioned, the, uh, the last event of our 2021 season and the final installment of Availing Toward Life, a three-part series of interactive study sessions on Ruskin's masterpiece on the first principles of political economy unto this last led for us by our friend, uh, Professor Jim Spates. If you've missed either or both of the previous sessions, no worries. They are posted on our YouTube channel at www.ruskinartclub.org. Tonight, we will conclude the series by taking a look at Ad Valorem, the final and longest of the four essays that make up unto this last. We will do this as we have in previous sessions by highlighting key paragraphs from the essay and then opening the floor up to discussion and comment. Since there's a lot to get through this week, this is a long essay, we have decided to look at the paragraphs more or less in thematic groups of three or so, two or three, and then open it up for discussion after we've uh, read through uh, several paragraphs. Obviously, a paragraph here or there can give us only a taste of the richness of these essays. But if you go onto our website in the calendar listing, you will find a PDF of the whole book with Clive Wilmer's marvelous notes and commentary, and also a PDF of each of the individual essays and a link to the selected paragraphs that we've been highlighting for each session. Jim Spates is Professor Emeritus of Sociology at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. He is the co-founder with Sarah Atwood in 2020 of the Ruskin Society of North America, webmaster of the blog site Why Ruskin, a companion of Ruskin's Guild of St. George, a member of the Roycroft campus community, and a member of the Ruskin Art Club of Los Angeles. Jim has lectured, of course, around, around the world in the UK, especially in the US on, uh, on Ruskin, a prolific writer um, of, uh, of academic works on Ruskin, works on Ruskin biography, and we, uh, and a great friend of the Ruskin Art Club, and we will uh, are delighted to turn all this over to Professor Spates. Thanks, Gabe. It's a it's a lovely uh, evening to have a chance a third a third evening with you folks. You've all been very good for coming back a number of times. Uh, although this is probably more appropriate at the very end of the hour, I'm going to do it now because I want to make sure that it gets done. I want to take a, a moment, to especially thank Gabe Meyer, Katrina Lau. Joey or Joseph Rodriguez and everybody at the Ruskin Art Club that has made these three sessions possible. It's been an enormous amount of work and uh, the technical skill involved in this is way beyond my capabilities on the internet and Zoom. And I thank these people so much. Gabriel has done a tremendous job spending much of his recent weekends um, working on these paragraphs, putting them up on the website for you all to have a look at beforehand. And if you haven't had a look at them beforehand, you can go back and have a look at them now because they're gonna be up for you to look at, at at your length and leisure as time goes on. So the last time that we were together, which was a week ago tomorrow night, uh, we did we did what we thought was the impossible. We did two, uh, two essays of Unto This Last. We tried to go through the highlights of the second essay, which is called The Veins of Wealth, and the third essay, which is called Key Judicatus Terum. And tonight what we're going to do is we're going to go through as best we can, 
And as Gabriel said a moment ago, um, it's, it, it can't help but be sort of a snapshot of an astonishingly complex and brilliant essay called Ad Valorum of Value. It's the fourth essay of Ruskin's Unto This Last series, which he, he always thought that Unto This Last, the four essays of Unto This Last were the most important things he ever wrote. And that's saying something because during his lifetime, he published six million plus words, six million plus words, rather astonishing. Um, and so this is only a very small segment of that of that collection that we're doing. And in any event, I want to give you a sense of how valuable and how complex uh, these essays of Unto This Last are. The, the first essay was called The Veins of Wealth, as you'll recall from two weeks ago. And the veins of wealth, if we have one takeaway from it, is Ruskin's argument that the veins of wealth are really service when human beings take care of one another, that we honor those who serve us, we don't honor those who do not serve us, and the ones who serve us are the ones are, who are deserving of our praise, our accolades, and in some cases, in some cases, our money. The second essay was called uh, the veins, uh, so, sorry, the, the second essay was called the, the Veins of Wealth. It was, and the Veins of Wealth, we didn't come to this sort of short summary of it at the end of the week last time, but a short summary of it might be the Veins of Wealth are purple, which he says at the very end of the essay. What he means by that is that the Veins of Wealth are full-blooded and fully healthily, healthily um, blooded. Uh, veins, um, the, the, the life, and he says at the very end, anticipating the essay we're going to talk about tonight, he says at the very end of, uh, of that essay that perhaps the, the true veins of wealth are purple and that human beings are in fact the end all and be all of the search for wealth itself. The third essay was called Key Judicatus Terum. Gabriel, could you show us the uh, one of the uh, Palazzo Publico? This is one of the one of the uh, Frescoes on the wall of the Palazzo Publico in Siena. This is called the Allegory of Good Government. It's a wonderful and huge essay. We talked about it some last time. Nowhere near enough to unpack it, but in the center, in the center right of it, you see the great figure of the common good. Ruskin thought that the the essence of all the great teachings of um, of the West were in, it were embodied in this in this particular fresco, the common good. Everybody is looking at the common good or supporting the common good. That are, are the great uh, the, the great spirits uh, around him, faith, hope, and charity above him. To his left and right, the great spirits, temperance and magnanimity and wisdom. And that wonderful figure on the left is of peace. And, and if we follow, if we follow the, the dictates of the great texts of the Western tradition, we will have a good city, we will have a good government, we will be happier as human beings. And Gabriel, let's look at the next one. The next one is on the opposite wall to this in the Palazzo Publico, and it's sort of weathered by age, as you can see, various parts of it have fallen out. And instead of the common good on the center right, you have a sort of devilish creature and all the creatures surrounding it are devils, which means that they have fallen away from the central lesson of our lives. The central lesson of our lives is to take care of one another. If I was to put a, uh, an, it, it, into a nutshell, the message of the third essay of Unto This Last, it, it, it would be this, it would be the golden rule. It would be the idea that you do unto others as that you would have them do unto you. And if you, act that way, wonderful things happen. And if you don't act that way, wonderful things don't happen. So you see right below the, the evil figure in the center right of this particular fresco, you see the figure of justice all fettered. She is down below, she's been forgotten. We are no longer just one another. We lie, we cheat, we steal. We, we gather money instead of trying to take care of other human beings as we go. And all of that becomes destructive to the social order. So we, we did a uh, I hope a creditable, but certainly not a fully adequate job on these two essays last week. And this week we go to this third, this third, actually the fourth essay of uh, unto this last called Ad Valorum of Value. And I, I need to just take one moment to tell you a little bit about it. It's twice as long as any of the other essays and that's on purpose. By the end of the 1850s, Ruskin was very dissatisfied with his body of work. In all his works, he had taken, he had made certain kinds of moral and 
essentially a betterment of society arguments. He was deeply against the, 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 the rampant, uh, the, the, the boots, uh, the heavy boots on the ground of the industrial revolution, the pollution of the air, the water and everything. And, um, and so he recommended to his readers that they should get out and start exercising their own agency to change the world into a better place. He felt by the late 1850s that they had not done that and he thought he had failed in his work. At which point he decided, well, what can I do next? And he was in a very serious depression at the time. So he decided, all right, I will write, write, write on a political economy. And uh, the, the uh, frescoes in the Palazzo Publico in Siena were a spur to this. I'll write on political economy. I will find out what the first principles, that's what Gabriel accurately said was the, uh, the, the, the full title of this little book. He said, the first principles of political economy, what are the things that underlie how we should do business and what are the things that always have underlie how we do business with each other? And so Ad Valorum is the fourth essay. The reason it is doubly long is that when Ruskin came back from the French Alps, in uh, the fall of 1860, his essays had already started to be published in a small magazine, an intellectual magazine called the Cornhill Magazine in London. They had raised such a furor, people, particularly people in business, had become so angry at the things that he was saying in these essays that they began writing the publisher saying, who is this guy? He's an art critic. We don't want to have anything to do with what he's saying. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So this guy, Ruskin, we should shut him down, keep him from speaking. And the furor became so great that William Macpeace Thackeray, the author of the great novel Vanity Fair, um, visited Ruskin at his home in South London in, uh, in the later fall of um, 1860 and informed Ruskin that even though that they had agreed on that there would be seven essays on political economy, three of them had been published. Key Judicat's Term had just been published. Three of them had been published. The, 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 the publisher, who was finding that no one was buying Ruskin's books anymore, and Ruskin had fallen into disgrace among all the intellectual circles of England at the time, that, that they would publish only one essay more, and that became Ad Valorum. And he, but, they, but he did say, Thackeray did say that they would make one concession, and that concession would be that it would be an essay of double length. That, so Ruskin had to compa compact essentially what was four essays into, into one longer one. And that's what we're gonna to try to deal with tonight, give you a sense of it. So I just wanted to say, give you that frame so you would know why this essay is so long. So what's going to happen now is that Gabriel and I, uh, we'll start with Gabriel, are gonna read a few of the paragraphs from under this last, uh, from Ad Valorum. And then we will have, after, after a few of these paragraphs, we'll have a brief discussion of them and then we'll go on to some other ones. So uh, Gabriel, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, you can start leading us through the paragraphs uh, of this incredibly wonderful and brilliant essay. Thank you, Jim. The eliciting of true definitions will give us the reply to our first question. What is value? Respecting which, however, we must first hear the popular statements the statements of, of economists generally. The word value when used without adjunct always means in political economy, value in exchange. This is a quote from John Stuart Mill. So that if two ships cannot exchange their rudders, their rudders are in political economic language of no value to either. But the subject of political economy is wealth. And wealth consists in all useful and agreeable objects which possess exchangeable values. Again, uh, from Mill. It appears then, according to Mr. Mill, that usefulness and agreeableness underlie the exchange value and must be ascertained to exist in the thing before we can esteem it an object of wealth. Now, the economical usefulness of a thing depends not merely on its own nature, but on the number of people who can and will use it. A horse is useless and therefore unsaleable if no one can ride, a sword if no one can strike, and meat if no one can eat. Thus, every material utility depends on its relative human capacity. Similarly, 
The agreeableness of a thing depends not merely on its own likableness, but on the number of people who could be caught to like it. The relative agreeableness and therefore saleableness of a pot of the smallest ale and of Adonis painted by a running brook depends virtually on the opinion of Demos in the shape of Christopher Sly. That's a reference to the, to the taming of the shrew. That is to say, the agreeableness of a thing depends on its relatively human disposition. Therefore, political economy being a science of wealth must be a science respecting human capacities and dispositions. But moral considerations having nothing to do with political economy, again, a reference to Mill, therefore, moral considerations have nothing to do with human capacities and dispositions. I do not wholly like the look of this conclusion from Mr. Mill's statements. Let us try Mr. Ricardo's. This is from David, uh, the, from David Ricardo. Much store has been set for centuries upon the use of our English classical education. It were to be wished that our well-educated merchants recall to mind always this much of their Latin schooling. That the nominative of valorem, a word already sufficiently familiar to them, is valor, a word which therefore ought to be familiar to them. Valor from valere, to be well or strong, the Greek hugieno, strong in life if a man or valiant, strong for life, if a thing or valuable. To be valuable, therefore, is to avail toward life. A truly valuable or availing thing is that which leads to life with its whole strength. In proportion as it does not lead to life, or as its strength is broken, it is less valuable. In proportion as it leads away from life, it is unvaluable or malignant. The value of a thing, therefore, is independent of opinion and of quantity. Think what you will of it, gain how much you may of it. The value of the thing itself is neither greater nor less, for ever it avails or avails not. No estimate can raise, no disdain repress, the power which it holds from the maker of things and of men. And so now I think we'd like to have, if we can, for a moment or two, a discussion of these. There's the one more paragraph, Jim. One more paragraph, sorry, Gabriel, go ahead. The real science of political economy, which has yet to be distinguished from the bastard science, as medicine from witchcraft and astronomy from astrology is that which teaches nations to desire and labor for the things that lead to life and which teaches them to scorn and destroy the things that lead to destruction. And if in a state of infancy, they supposed indifferent things such as excrescences of shellfish and pieces of blue and red stone to be valuable and spent large measures of the labor which ought to be employed for the extension and ennobling of life in diving or digging for them and cutting them into various shapes. Or if in the same state of infancy, they imagine precious and beneficent things such as air, light and cleanliness to be valueless. Or if finally they imagine the conditions of their own existence by which alone they can truly possess or use anything such for instance as peace trust and love to be prudently exchangeable when the markets offer for gold, iron, or excrescences of shells. The great and only science of political economy teaches them in all these cases what is vanity and what substance, and how the service of death, the lord of waste, and of eternal emptiness differs from the service of wisdom, the lady of saving and of eternal fullness. She who has said, I will cause those that love me to inherit substance 
and I will fill their treasures. Thanks, Gabe. Sorry for uh, interrupting a moment ago. So now, if we, if you would uh, work with us, we'd like to have a moment or two or a few minutes just to discuss these critically important passages. The um, the subtitle of Ruskin's four essays are the first principles of political economy, and what we have just heard and what we've just read and so so brilliantly rendered here is that the idea of value underlies everything that we do in terms of human life and that the fundamental thing is to find the things that essentially produce life, not the things that produce anything other than life or less than life. Ruskin uses the phrase, and it is a wonderful phrase, a thing avails towards life. In other words, it supports life, it helps life, it brings life into being or it does not do that, or it does it in various kinds of stages of helpfulness or availingness in terms of, and so that what we, it is our obligation as, um, as human beings to create those, only those things that lead towards life. I was a teacher for many years, and I used to always say to my students, not always, but very frequently say to my students on a given day before a weekend, uh, I would say, so that TV program or that series that you've been watching on TV of late, when you are done with it, when you've spent that hour, are you a better human being for having done so? Has it, in other words, has it availed towards life? Take, it a, take another example, that copy of Shakespeare that's on all of your shelves, the copy of Hamlet that's on all of your shelves, in it is an enormous amount of life, life usefulness availing towards life qualities. How much of it is, is there is, is there now? It was there whether you have a very expensive edition or a very cheap edition. And Ruskin says it doesn't matter what it costs you, the, the life force is in it. It's up to you to get the life force out. He earlier said in one of the paragraphs that Gabriel read about this notion of human capacity, you have to be able to get out of the thing the value, the life value that is in it. Human capacity is central to this. These are radical ideas, uh, radical, radical social thought of John Ruskin. These are radical ideas. Nobody ever talked about making only making those things that lead to life uh, or the things that we know that support life. A horse is useless if no one can ride, a sword, a sword if no one can strike. The value lies in the thing. It was put into the thing by the by the ability and the strength and the wisdom of the person who created it. And then it will be used or not used properly by those who come to it later on. So the, that's a bit of a frame for how different this is. So this is one of the things that made the businessmen of Ruskin say so angry with him. He said, you really should only be involved in making those things that help other human beings become better and stronger human beings. Never be involved, never deign, never descend to the point where you would be involved in making something that injures another human being. So that, that, that's enough from that side. Availing Towards Life is the title of my book that I'm writing on onto this last, that we avail towards life with all our strength. Anybody else? Well, I'll chime in here, Jim. It's good to see you this evening. I'm glad to be here talking about this essay tonight. Um, you know, this the, this definition um, ultimately is is the groundwork from which the rest of the essay develops. It's, it's a developmental essay, and you know the, the key term that, that Ruskin then plays out to the rest of this thing is is this notion of what value is, and the the radical piece, you know, to to your uh, the title of these lectures, Jim, I think is is its inherent critique of capitalism which is an inherently amoral economic system. You know, it doesn't matter what you produce as long as you can sell it and get enough people to buy it. And I think that's the sort of the paradigmatic shift that Ruskin is making here that's so powerful and that ultimately sets up how the rest of um, his analysis proceeds. Well said, Zach, Zach true enough. Um, Ruskin was not an anti-capitalist in the deepest sense. He hated what many of the capitalists were doing. He was a deep opponent of what we would call today laissez-faire capitalism, the idea that, as Zach just described it, you can go out and produce whatever you want. The, the, real, pro the real issue is to get as many people to buy it as you possibly can and to make as, uh, as much money out of it as you possibly can. That is never the issue, says Ruskin. 
You remember back from the first essay, he said that the merchants, the merchants function is to create the things that people need and distribute to them when they need it most at a price that is the cheapest he can possibly afford. So Ruskin was never a deep anti-capitalist. He, he thought we could have an honest capitalism. I, I so enjoy his humor always at the critical moment. And one looks at his description of pearls, rubies, and uh, sapphires as excrescences of shellfish and pieces of blue and red stone with the kind of wisdom behind that. In other words, let's, let's get perspective on what these values are, how moral values not really trump uh, 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 the values of, of industry and commerce and, and the world, the worldliness of it all, but rather should be an infusion within the, the way in which uh, all of that usefulness, all those useful things are exchanged. E extremely beautiful, extremely wry and dry humor. So, so pertinent. We I also- I said, uh, <laughs> responding to that, I think I said, Stuart, a couple of weeks ago that so many times because Ruskin is so earnest that we miss the point that there's uh, often a great deal of humor Exactly. Uh, in some of the examples he uses and in, the, and in the way he weaves some of these images together. Well, he's soaring. He's really soaring above the, the, the land uh, 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 that he's observing. And that height from which he perceives all of our folly uh, allows him that wonderful break into uh, a smile. Yet at the same time, very few of us regard our economic exchanges in that particular way. So this whole notion that we should produce only those things that lead to life um, is absolutely critical to take away. I believe that one of the central things that Ruskin, um, that kept Ruskin from being accepted at the time and people hated him for the things that he was saying was that he went against the grain. People in business then and most people still in business now think that the object of being in business is to make money and as much of it as possible, however, you, whatever you have to do to make it. No, says Ruskin, that's never been the object. The object is to provide the things that lead to life, that avail towards life. So, and we miss that, we miss that then, we miss it now. It's, um, Zach is right to call the capitalism that we practice amoral. I think that's true, that we do not make moral judgments. Ruskin said, this is always a moral issue, if you remember, part of the discussion last week was to talk about there are always two issues that surround money. One is how is it made? Is it made in a in a way that essentially takes respects the people who make it and pays them decently for having made it? And how is it spent? How do you spend your money? Do you spend it on excrescences of self shellfish, as uh, Stuart pointed out a moment ago, or do you, do you spend it by contributing to a cancer research fund? Do you spend it on, on, uh, on a carton of cigarettes or do you, just, do you spend it on something wonderful and delicious to eat in the season in which it's produced? One of the things that I, I would look for in my future reading of Ruskin is how he accommodates, you may know this, Jim, you may know this, Gabe, how he accommodates the financial industries, which uh, ultimately make some people very, very rich and then curiously, as water rushes to fill a vacuum, uh, um, um, these great monies that are made have now uh, spawned enormous foundations, Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In some ways, America has become a de facto social state in the best sense uh, through the functionality of these uh, foundations. And I would love to know if you have a quick way of saying, what does Ruskin say about the, the um, about charity, yes, exactly. I know what he feels about charity, but but he wouldn't. He what would he have said about what has happened here? Enormous fortunes and enormous uh, nonprofit foundations non in the government. Nonprofit organizations. Nonprofit organizations. Yeah. Like the Ruskin Art Club. Yeah. Well, I think that fundamentally he would be uh, in deep support of those organizations that are using the money that they have made however they have made it, he would have issues per, perhaps surrounding that, yeah. however they have made it. 
um, to help human beings in need. So let's say the American Cancer Society is a, a, an organization that he would feel very strongly about, we should do it. He would applaud, I can't imagine he would do anything but applaud what our current president is doing now. I don't mean to get into politics, oh, but is <laughs> essentially organi organizing in such a way to keep the world healthier from this, this dread COVID thing that's going around. Anything that leads towards life makes people stronger. Availing towards life, right. that is a fundamental phrase. Two thoughts uh, come to mind here. One is uh, how Ruskin, I think, is being echoed in a pithy way by Oscar Wilde, <laughs> wow. who castigates those who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. That's good. Yes. And uh, another thought uh, has to do with what philosophers call axiology, uh, an account of value or an account of the good. And a number of natural law thinkers <clears throat> make a distinction between goods internal to the person and external goods. And one of the things that would be said about goods internal to the person is that they cannot be bought and sold. They cannot be understood as mere commodities. And Jim's point earlier on about what are you going to do with the weekend comes to mind here to suggest an example. In the library, and I know a student hangout that's a bar that's called the library. In the library, uh, there is no knowledge. There are various ways of presenting systems of symbols, but there is no knowledge. Knowledge is within the person who understands what these symbols are pointing towards. So knowledge is within the person and the addition, cheap addition, not so cheap addition, is an instrumental good rather than an intrinsic good. And I think again and again, we could look at Ruskin saying, don't be caught up in the, the lust for external goods. Look always at the good in terms of the imminent goods, the goods intrinsic to the person. That's right. One of the things Ruskin always said in different places was, every person you meet, look for what is good in them. Honor it, treasure it, support it, help it. And those are the things that we should be fundamentally concerned about in our interactions with others. Yeah, I think we should move on. OK, let's go on to the next paragraph. Hence, it follows that if a thing is to be useful, it must, not, must, it must be not only of availing nature, but in availing hands. This is a critical point. Or in accurate terms, usefulness is value in the hands of the valiant. So this science of wealth being, as we have just seen, when regarded as the science of accumulation, accumulative of capacity, as well of, as of material, that would suggest to me education. When regarded as a science of distribution, it is distribution not absolute, but discriminant. Not of everything to every man, but of the right thing to the right man. A difficult science depending on more than arithmetic. Now we come to one of the critical passages of the whole book. Wealth, therefore, is the possession of the valuable by the valiant. And in considering it as a power existing in a nation, the two elements, the value of the thing and the value of its possessor must be estimated together. Whence it appears that many of the persons commonly considered wealthy are in reality no more wealthy than the locks of their own strong boxes are, they being inherently and eternally incapable of wealth and operating for the nation in an economical, next paragraph gave, in an economical point of view, either as pools of dead water and in eddies of a stream, 
which, so long as the stream flows, are useless or serve only to drown people, but may become of importance in a state of stagnation should the stream dry. Or else, as dams in a river, of which the ultimate servants depends not on the dam, but on the miller. Or else, as mere accidental stays and impediments, acting not as wealth, but for we ought to have a correspondent term as ilf. I think we mentioned this last week, but this is a critical Ruskin term, ilf causing various devastation and trouble around them in all directions. Or lastly, act not at all, but are merely animated conditions of delay, no use being possible of anything until they, until they are dead. <laughs> in which last condition they are nonetheless often useful as delays, as impedimentia, if a nation is apt to move too fast. Gabe, are we pausing here or are we going on for one more? Oh, going paragraph on for five. Thus far then of more. wealth. Wealth is the possession of the valuable in the hands of the valiant. In other words, the people who can use it. So that let's take let's take this set of four essays for a moment. Let me pause for a second here. This set of four essays is, is a wonderful thing, and it constantly, I've told you before in my earlier remarks and earlier sessions, that it has given me wealth. Um, time and time again over the course of the 20 and more years that I have been reading it. The wealth was put there by John Ruskin. He is the person who understood these things. He was the person who figured out how to put them, as Stuart reminded us, in, in, in a brilliant way that we can, we can understand it. And when we understand it, a light goes off and we say, oh my goodness, isn't that terrific? And that is life being enlivened, availing towards life. Note first, I'm going back to the text now. Next, we have to ascertain the nature of price. That is to say of exchange value and its expression by currencies. Note first of exchange. This is again, a very important aspect of what he's trying to get us to understand and what made many of the people of his time so angry. It is only in labor that there can be profit. That is to say a quote, making in advance or quote, making in favor of from proficio. In exchange, there is only advantage, i.e. a bringing advantage of power to the exchanging persons. Thus, one man by sowing and reaping turns one measure of corn into two measures. That is profit. Another by digging and forging turns one spade into two spades. That is profit. Profit or material gain is, only, is attainable only by construction or by discovery, not by exchange. Whenever material gain follows exchange, for every plus there is precisely an equal minus. So this is a an argument very much like the argument he made about money in the previous uh, in the previous essay. If I have a dollar, you don't. If I have a hundred dollars, you and you have two dollars, then I have much more than you, and I can do what I like with it, and you can do what you can with two dollars, which isn't much compared to me. Unhappily, for the progress of the science of political economy, the plus qualities. Oh, this is a, such a beautiful paragraph. The plus qualities, or if I may be allowed to coin an awkward plural, the pluses make a very positive and a venerable appearance in the world. This is the tour of the, the tour of the stars' homes in Hollywood, so that everyone is eager to learn the science which produces results so magnificent, so magnificent. Whereas the minuses have, on the other hand, a tendency to retire into the back streets and in other places of shade, or even get themselves wholly and finally put out of sight in graves which renders the algebra of this science peculiar and difficultly legible. A large number of its negative science being written by the account keeper in a kind of red ink, which starvation thins and makes strangely pale and even quite invisible ink for the present. So this is about the people who wind up having nothing. If there's a hundred dollars available and I have 98 of it, and that means everybody else has to deal with, has to live with the two. Somebody somewhere is gonna get nothing. And that's what he's talking about here at the very end of this paragraph. Gabriel, six, are we going on with one more or are we ready? No, let's, let's pause for a discussion. All right, let's pause for a discussion. Anything on this folks, this is really something that would, we, we, we think in terms of profit, I made money on that. It cost me $10 to make it and I sold it for 12. So I made $2 on every item that I sold. If I do enough of it, I get, I get to be rich and I get to have fancy cars and a big mansion and I get to buy the very best wines and all of those things that, are, that make other people jealous of me. Ruskin, Ruskin would say that may be in fact true, but it isn't, doesn't mean that these are objects of wealth to you. So let's hear if anybody else has comments on these. 
paragraphs. Uh, well, uh, I follow an Indian uh, teacher whose name is Sad, S-A-D-H, Guru, pretty well known. By the age of 20, uh, by age of 50, he had 20 or 30 million dollars in industrial earnings. And he had an epiphany, which uh, led him to desire and to become a teacher whose goal was to make help pe people flower, in his words. And his most recent uh, vignette, which I caught actually just today, suggested that the tendency for parents to tell your child to be number one, come back with all A's and be number one in the school, beat everybody else, means necessarily that you want to be above everybody else. That that's the goal. It's a wrong goal. And Ruskin is echoed not only by people like Sadhguru, but by Khalil Gibran, by Krishnamurti, by Gandhi, by so many profound spiritual thinkers. He articulates it in terms of, in an English that is exquisite and very mechanical. There's a kind of functional engine that he gives us with which to think. He, he really is brilliant and it's a delight. It is a delight. I was in Florida not terribly long ago, and I have a, a friend who's in the arts, and he is a very, very rich fellow, and he has a bunch of other people that he knows, and they're all very, very rich fellows, and uh, one fellow was saying, over as we had a glass of wine before dinner on this night, he said, I have 500 Picasso ceramics, and I thought to myself, 500 Picasso ceramics, at some point, maybe at number 36, maybe at number 40, 42, or 118, it didn't become quite so novel and so important and so fulfilling anymore. So I, again, the, the, the final vacuity of having all these material positions that, that we need a certain amount of money to live and that's what we need to live. But we don't need 100,000 or 200,000 or a million or $2 million or $5 million more in order to live decently and well. We want to keep our life force strong one of the richest men, at the risk of being too, too present here, one of the richest men in the world, Warren Buffett, uh, many, many, many years ago, decades ago, had more than enough money to live like a pasha, like a king. Uh, he kept on doing what he did uh, again and again and again and became the first or second or third wealthiest man and richest man in the world, shall we say. But he did it because he loved the challenge of doing it, not because he loved the money or what it could bring. He lived in the same modest house. He drove a Cadillac for 20 years and he just sold it at auction for charity. And if you've ever listened to him talk about the way in which he, he operates, he does it not to attain 500 Picasso ceramics for the sake of having a number. But your man obviously was boasting about that. The fact is as an art dealer, I find uh, constantly, I'm constantly confronted by the difference between external value as uh, it was said earlier and internal um, internal uh, value because art does seem to have this almost synaptic connection between the object uh, externally and the internal reception of it. it, it it's a magical uh, connection that I have I have delighted in all these many years and continue to do so. And yes, there's a profit to be made in it, but uh, and many art dealers are simply commodity brokers. But uh, 500 ceramics, it seems excessive, but then again, they're all very different from each from each. He seems to have been guilty of, of boasting, it seems. I think that's I, true. Yeah. So in terms of one? value, my students and I have been talking a lot about the value of education and the difference between its value and its cost. And I made the comment to them today that, that uh, Ruskin would view that that sort of wealth, the wealth that comes from knowledge, from gaining knowledge, from education, brings great responsibility. And in that way, all wealth does. The more you have, the more you're responsible for. You don't get it just to be greedy and keep it. You have to get it in order to use it to promote life. Well, that's what we would hope, Kay, absolutely right, but that isn't what everybody does. A lot of people then just make the money and then they use it to make more money and use it to make more money. And one of their objectives is to crush their, their competitors, so to speak. Rush, Ruskin would think that all this notion of trying to crush somebody else and put them out of business is reprehensible. Okay, we're gonna go on for the moment here. 
with, with a couple more paragraphs here. This being the real nature of capital, it, we've left out a lot, folks, and I apologize for that, but I urge you very strongly to go back to the text and read it. Let it sit for a while, think about it, read it again, let it sit for a while, think about it, read it again. This being the real nature of capital, it follows that there are two kinds of true production always going on in an active state. Again, one of the critical passages of this essay, one of seed and one of food, or production for the ground and for the mouth, both of which are by covetous persons thought to be production for the granary only. Whereas the function of the granary is but intermediate and conservative, fulfilled in distribution, Else it ends in nothing but mildew and nourishment of rats and worms. And since production for the ground is useful, only useful with future hope of harvest, all essential production is for the mouth, meaning in terms of strengthening us, availing towards life, and is finally measured by the mouth. Hence, as I said above, consumption is the crown of production and the wealth of a nation is only to be estimated by what it consumes. Next paragraph, Gabe. I left this question to the reader's thought two months ago, and uh, we haven't been here yet ourselves, but this is one of the greatest paragraphs in all of Ruskin. Choosing rather that he should work it out for himself rather than to have it sharply stated to him. But now the ground being sufficiently broken and the details into which the several questions here opened must lead us being too complex for discussion in the pages of a periodical so that I must pursue them elsewhere. I desire in closing the series of introductory papers to leave this one great flag clearly stated. If there's only six words about Ruskin that anybody knows, it's these next six words. There is no wealth but life. What people don't know are these following words, which are just wonderful and also, in my view, equally important. Life, including all its powers of love, of joy, and of admiration. That country is the richest, which nourishes the greatest number of noble and happy human beings. That man is richest who, having perfected the functions of his own life to the utmost, has also the widest helpful influence, both personal and by means of his possessions, over the lives of others. So going back to another point of Stewart's, if uh, Warren Buffett, I know very little about Warren Buffett, took all of those billions that he has and turned it into some way to improve the body politic or get rid of cancer or whatever, that would be admirable. That would be um, the, um, the roots of service the, 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 that we admire or we should admire. Um, there is no wealth but life. It's a critical phrase, including all its powers of love, of joy and admiration. And then going on, that country is the richest, and that person is the richest. This is just such one. Of, this is just one of the great passages in all of Ruskin, and he knew it. He knew it was one of the best things he had ever written. Okay. Uh, Jim Gabriel, Buffett. are we doing? Mm -hmm. No, that's it. Okay, we're time. All right. Stopping. So let, let's have a bit of a discussion about about this here. There is no wealth but life. Uh, Jim Buffett has. Uh, joined the giving pledge that Bill Gates created and his entire fortune, he, he, he has co-created it with Bill Gates and he's already given 50% of his fortune away and he will give the rest of it away. And he's told his wife that she'll have more than enough to live on and just inhabit it in the mutual funds when he passes away. His kids both have foundations, they do extraordinary work. And, and it's just, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a brilliant man, it's a wonderful Good. Person. Good and an occasion for our applause. Yes, for sure. Yes, uh, one of the things that is worth noting here is they again. It's part of the uh, the humor uh, when Ruskin says that country is the richest, which nourishes the greatest number of noble and happy human beings. Um, as uh, Clive Wilmer notes, Ruskin is playing on the favorite tags of his opponents. The utilitarians, for instance, aimed at the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Ruskin's introduction of nobility is therefore significant. The political economists argued that the country was richest whose people owned the largest number of material things. Ruskin's redefinition of wealth therefore colors his use of the word richest and the emphasis on number and quantification in general prepares us for his attack 
on the Malthusian argument in the next paragraph. So he, he does give us a little leeway when he says that man is richest who, having yeah. perfected the functions of his own life to the utmost. That's yes. a pretty open statement. And so one can be Warren Buffett, one can be Elon Musk and live in a 40 room man. But one can't be Al Capone, Stuart. Oh no, <laughs> no, 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 one can't be Al Capone. Agree with you there, Jim. Okay. Well, there, there is, there is a, a kind of a spirituality built around the danger of riches, which yes. Yes. not all the wealthy um, uh, manage to avoid. Well, uh, the NRA uh, tells us guns don't kill people, people kill people. We, we are all seduced by those levels of riches when we encounter them. We, we see people driving around in these cars that cost $500,000 and we say, oh my goodness, isn't that great? I'd love to have one of those. But having one of those, a few weeks later, you realize that, well, I have one of those, but that, that's all I have now. Um, so, so that you, we, we, we're all seduced. Uh, all the advertisements on television are all designed to do one thing, to make you feel unhappy that you don't have what the person who is so joyous in the ad has. And it won't make you want to go out and get what the person who is in the ad has, whether it's the car or whether it's the mansion or what, whatever it may be. Um, we, we live on images of, of, of so-called deprivation, even though most of us, most of us in the richest nation the world has ever known have, although not all of us do, as we talked about last week, um, have enough to get by on decently. <laughs> Here are two more thoughts. Uh, the, the first is if, if you listen to politicians, and this goes for both parties, and certainly at the highest level in both parties, they love to talk about the United States as being the greatest country in the world. The greatest country in the world. And uh, it would be a wonderful thing if friends of Ruskin could somehow in the chat box <laughs> suggest that they tell us what their standard of greatness is, uh, but, but they don't. And the greatness that's implicit in what they say is uh, uh, military power and uh, political power. So I think Ruskin gives us a, a wonderful test for that kind of wretched rhetoric. Uh, another thought is this, when some individual or some family becomes enormously wealthy, yes, I think it's better that the wealth is used to uh, give foundations, uh, fund foundations, rather than to use it simply for their private entertainment. However, however, the foundations themselves need to be closely examined. Uh, what can happen is you have a foundation that's produced and really the agenda of the foundation turns out to be a particular uh, political agenda uh, or it turns out to be a particular passion of the, of the family or the individual that gives us the foundation. Uh, and I have nothing against the foundations, nothing whatsoever. But behind a foundation, well, there are human intentions there and some are for the good and some are for the not so good. And I think we oughtn't to lose track of that. I agree with you, Jim. I think that is absolutely essential. Ruskin would say with all of these things, we have to go back and look at again, to remind you from our discussion last week, how was the money made? Was it made by essentially strengthening and giving life, availing towards life for the other people, uh, for the people who worked for you and so on? Or was it made in some way by skimming a bit off the top and keeping some of the some of the, uh, the due wages, let's say, that they, they, they deserve from them? Somebody has to be poor. If somebody's really, really rich, somebody somewhere has to be poor. Ruskin says, I, I, I know that my father, was, well, my father was rich. As far as I know, he never used it to exploit any of the people who worked for him. So as far as the foundations are concerned, the idea, you're absolutely right. We should have a good 
good hard look at them. How did they make their money? I also wanted to make one other comment, which we've been kind of skirting and not talking much about. The, the, that, no, that nation is richest that nourishes the greatest number of noble and happy human beings. Let's take the word noble. I think that's really critical to what he's trying to get at here. The fundamental idea is to make us stronger and education is a process. We now have universal education. Ruskin was fundamentally involved in it and believed in it. Dickens was fundamentally involved in it and believed in it. So were many others. But the idea is that, that we need to have the strength that education gives us in the best sense. And as Kay reminded us a moment ago in talking about her own students, you begin to educate them, you begin to make them nobler human beings by giving them these great ideas that perhaps earlier they have not been exposed to, or if exposed to it, they have not been made to think that these are critical ideas. So to educate, although some education can be uh, hard and difficult um, and, and not very helpful, to educate to an understanding of what it means to be a human being, what it means to be alive and, and the responsibility, I think Kay mentioned this as well, the responsibility of being a human being are essential things on the road to greater nobility. Gabriel? I have actually a quick, you know, I just wanted to, to, to mention. Um, yeah. Um, what, I, what I love about Ruskin is his ability to know me and how quick my idea of, um, if you could go back to the slide before, because I don't want to mess up, <laughs> mess it up, because I'll definitely uh, misquote. You're gonna to have to go back another one. There you go. There you go. Okay. That well, who having perfected the functions of his own life, I am so quick to change that line because I am afraid of struggle. And when I find the perfect life and look around at what I have and the jobs, and I too work in education and have a beautiful home and food. There's always the need for more. And I'm always presented with Ruskin and his work. Uh, when is that need? Uh, when is enough enough? And what does perfection look like? Because for an individual like myself, um, I tend to, to focus on feeling comfortable as opposed to accepting what I have and um, to, 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 to look at what I have as, as wealthy with respect to giving me life, I am ridiculously rich. But it definitely depends on what side of the bed I wake up on. And uh, I, I've been so, so fortunate to be a part of this club, but Ruskin always tends to know me very well. Um, so I just wanted to say that. Thank you for you know, letting me share a little bit. Thanks, Joey. Gabe? Yeah. Well, you know, Joey, just to comment, um, um, Ruskin nails us all. <laughs> That's one, one of the reasons that people got so upset when they read Unto This Last, not because they didn't understand it, but because they did. That's Actually, right. could, I, could I throw something in there too? That, that one statement of perfecting one's own life for me, really gives a spiritual lens by which I look at a lot of Indian sages such as Sri Ramana Maharshi, stuff like that, because they've really focused on that aspect. And therefore, it opens the door to view them as rich in the same definition as, you know, our millionaires and billionaires, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's really beautiful for myself to read that. And one of the things that Joey just made very clear to us is that if you go back to it a time and time again, you see nuances or you feel nuances that you didn't feel before and they elevate you, they lift you like the, like when you finish a great, a great book, great novel or a great poem, you say, oh, wow, that's really incredible. You are a, a, a better human being as a result of it. You are, have been encouraged, you've been availing towards life, You're, you've been given more life. As before we get into the very next paragraph, if you just skim it quickly. As a poet, you pick up things that are, I mean, every, the words are just wise, the heart, love, uh, breath, rejoices, uh, um, fair, 
full, trim, sweet, frequent. I mean, he is a man of great positive energy and, and delight. Before I read, I just, I just want to note that while there were many people, as Jim has mentioned to us a number of times in Ruskin's audience that were offended by Ruskin's vision of political economy, there were also people who were converted by it. Uh, this is to make the note that uh, Trevor and Joey have, have made about the, the powerful effect of this on our own decisions on the way that we, that we choose to live. Um, Mohapna Gandhi was a uh, South African lawyer uh, and read unto this last on a train. And as he said, uh, I, I don't have the quote at handy, I, I wish we did, but uh, he said that when he got off the train and finished reading the book, he was another man and that he knew what he wanted to do with his life and he knew how he wanted to do it. Ruskin had simply opened up to him uh, a whole uh, world, a, a sacred world of ethics and responsibility and integration that, um, that changed his life. So uh, this, uh, this work has had lots of effects, different sorts of effects on people. So let's continue. Nor need our more sentimental economists fear the too widespread of the formalities of a mechanical agriculture. The presence of a wise population implies the search for felicity as well as food. Nor can any population reach its maximum but through that wisdom which rejoices in the habitable parts of the earth. The desert has its appointed place and work, the eternal engine whose beam is the earth's axle, whose beat is its year and whose breath is its ocean, will still divide imperiously to their desert kingdoms bound with unfurrable rock and swept by unarrested sand, their powers of frost and fire. But the zones and lands between habitable will be loveliest in habitation. The desire of the heart is also the light of the eyes. No scene is continually and untiringly loved, but one rich by joyful human labor, smooth in field and fair in garden, full in orchard, trim, sweet and frequent in homestead, ringing with voices of vivid existence. No air is sweet that is silent. It is only sweet when full of low currents of undersound, triplets of bird and murmur and chirp of insects and deep toned words of men and wayward trebles of childhood. As the art of life is learned, it will be found at last that all lovely things are also necessary. The wild cornflower by the wayside as well as the tended corn and the wild birds and creatures of the forest as well as the tended cattle because man doth not live by bread only, but also by the desert manna, by every wondrous word and unknowable work of God, happy in that he knew them not, nor did his fathers know, and that round about him reaches yet into the infinite, the amazement of his existence. Gabriel, before you go on, I know there's one more fantastic paragraph at the very end of Ed Warren that you're going to share with us. But this is one of the most beautiful things that I can imagine anybody writing. I sometimes look at the things I write and I say, well, if I could only write a sentence as good as Ruskin's, that hardly ever happens. Every once in a while I get a phrase that's very nice or something like that. But to be able to do this, this is the work of this is the work of sheer genius, that everything around us, surrounding us, is holy and and in fact, necessary, the wonderful word and a noble work of God, happy in that he knew them not, nor did his fathers know, and that round about him reaches into the infinite, the amazement of his, meaning our human existence. Here we are, these special creatures in the universe, and we truly are special creatures in the universe. This is inspiring. This passage is availing towards life. Final paragraphs of 
ad valorem and the final paragraphs of Unto This Last. For us at all events, her work must begin at the entry of the doors. All true economy is law of the house. Strive to make that law strict, simple, generous. Waste nothing and grudge nothing. Care in no wise to make more of money, but care to make much of it. Remembering always the great palpable inevitable fact, the rule and root of all economy, that what one person has, another cannot have, and that every atom of substance of whatever kind used or consumed is so much human life spent, which if it issue in the saving present life or gaining more is well spent, but if not, is either so much life prevented or so much slain. In all buying, consider first what condition of existence you cause in the producers of what you buy. Secondly, whether the sum you have paid for it is just to the producer and in due proportion lodged in his hands. Thirdly, to how much clear use for food, knowledge, or joy this that you have bought can be put. And fourthly, to whom and in what way it can be most speedily and serviceably distributed in all dealings whatsoever, insisting on entire openness and stern fulfillment. And in all wings on perfection and loveliness of accomplishment, especially on fineness and purity of all marketable commodity, watching at the same time for all ways of gaining or teaching powers of simple pleasure and of showing oson and ashfodelo meg oneyar, it's Greek, how great blessing lies in mallow and ashfodel, the sum of enjoyment depending not on the quantity of things tasted, but on the vivacity and patience of taste. And if on due and honest thought over these things, it seems the kind of existence to which men are now summoned by every plea of pity and claim of right may for some time at least not be a luxurious one. Consider whether even supposing it guiltless, luxury would be desired by any of us. If we saw clearly at our sides, the suffering which accompanies it. Luxury, which accompanies it in the world. Luxury is indeed possible in the future. Innocent and exquisite luxury for all and by the help of all. But luxury at present can only be enjoyed by the ignorant. The cruelest man living could not sit at his feast unless he sat blindfold. Raise the veil boldly, face the light, and if as yet the light of the eye can only be through tears and the light of the body through sackcloth, go thou forth weeping, bearing precious seed until the time come and the kingdom when Christ's gift of bread and bequest of peace shall be unto this last as unto thee. And when for earth severed multitudes of the wicked and the weary, there shall be holier reconciliation than that of the narrow home and calm economy, where the wicked cease not from trouble, but from troubling, and the weary are at rest. I mentioned to you earlier in one of our sessions that the manuscripts for the third and fourth essays of Unto This Last are at the Huntington in San Marino, not far from where many of you are uh, par taking part in this Zoom. I can tell you from my ag examination of this, uh, of, the, of this manuscript of Ad Valorum, the fourth one, that this passage, this last passage that Gabriel just read is not in the manuscript at the Huntington. It is one of those, one of those that Ruskin regarded, I believe, as his very best. And because he regarded it as his very best, he gave it away to somebody. 
I don't know to whom, I don't know whether it still exists or where it is, uh, but he, he gave it away. It's just not there, nor is the passage on there is no wealth but life. That is not in the manuscript either. Um, I was deeply disappointed not to be able to see these in their written form, but they are, they went out to do some other good in the world separately. This is a glorious bit of writing. We, we who are here tonight and who are in admiration of Ruskin and his work um, should count ourselves among the lucky of the earth that we have found these wonderful words and we can come back to them and read them again and again. And that uh, uh, where, where the wicked cease, not from trouble, but from troubling and the weary are at rest. No more will we exploit each other. No more will we take advantage of one another. Um, this is a deeply humane text. It is committed from its first word to its last to the wonder of our existence, as he says it in a passage we read a moment ago, to um, the strength of our own humanity, that the greatest thing in the world is a strong and healthy and happy and noble human being. And we should do everything in our power to create such day by day, week by week, month by month, as we go along. So thank you, Gabriel, for that lovely reading. Thank you to the Ruskin Art Club for allowing us to have this discussion or these, these, this number of discussions. And thank you all for attending. So we have a few minutes left here at the very end, though you've all been patient to last this long, um, where we can have a bit more discussion if, if we would like. Yeah, I'll throw in some comments just in, in part responding. I, this is a beautiful passage, Gabriel, and, and well read. Um, thank you for that. Um, you know, this conversation about billionaires and, and listening to this last bit in particular, you know, I think there's, you know, discussion about how billionaires spend their money and foundations and such. I, I think Ruskin would have found any system that allows for a billionaire to be an indefensible type of political economy. I think he would have found that regardless of any kind of value placed on what you made, it, it was founded on an unjust advantage. And often the rich are spending their money to fix problems they created or the system that allowed it to happen um, to sort of put a you know, Band-Aid on a, on a sinking ship. And so I, and this, this passage, I think, you know, rings that. And I think that's the radical nature of his, of, of his writing here. I mean, he's really challenging um, that notion of individual wealth. And from sort of a social um critique perspective you know because i'm also interested in others who, who have written criticisms of capitalism from this era particularly marx who is contemporaneous and i think the one bit that really makes ruskin um valuable in that canon is his emphasis on consumption um you know there's a lot of focus in this era on the laborer and the structure of labor relations um which are valuable and good but i think the one angle that ruskin really adds is the the moral element of consumption the product itself and what it means to the people who consume it and to the people who make it and i really think he stands out for that contribution to our analysis of of a political economy and this is clearly to me implicit in what you're saying zach the idea of human responsibility you know behind all of this is, is the idea that we are here only for one fundamental pur purpose, and that is to take, take care of each other, to ease each other's way, to use our strengths and our powers to make each other better than we were or what we're capable of giving. That's what he means by honing the, what, the, the, the traits of your own profession to the utmost and then giving it away. That's what he means by that, taking care of, taking care of, of others. So I think you're fundamentally right. I want to go back to this notion of the law of the house. The law of the house, he would have us imagine a house, your house, any house, the house that we're in right now, and say, what do you want for the, that house and the people who live in it? And your answer would be, as I presume all our answers would be, well, I want the best for them. I want them to have adequate food, clothing, shelter. I want them to be happy in life. I want to give them the things that I am capable of giving them that allow them to be happy in life. And he is fun, law of the house. It is behind everything that is that he's written about in all his political economy. He went on for the next decade writing much more political economy, not our subject tonight. But in fact, it's always about this law of the house. The cruelest man living, if we understand these things, could not could not accept luxury if we knew that it 
Essentially, it was on the backs of somebody that we had taken advantage of some time ago. The responsibility that we all bear as human beings. He was criticized roundly, soundly, and as I told you earlier, essentially censored from writing um, the last three essays of, of, of Unto This Last in the Cornhill magazine. The, um, his publishers, Smith and Elder, were threatened by the fact that as he became more and more controversial, as he published more and more essays of Unto This, as they published more and more essays of Unto This Last, that people just stopped buying his books. He was a cash cow to them. He was a fellow that, that sold so many books, he was so popular. These essays of Unto This Last were written at the height of his popularity, after which he began to sink in popularity because he never really fundamentally got over the critiques of the time. He was called, he, he, one critic said he was preaching, it was like listening to a mad governess preaching to a crowd, a mad governess. He didn't know what he was talking about. He didn't understand economics. I believe that Ruskin fundamentally threatens us in our way of life in the modern world. Uh, I think Zach is saying that too in, in a slightly different way, but meaning essentially the same kind of thing that Ruskin goes right for the jugular. He says, look, you guys are in essence living on the, uh, the, the, the profits or the, let's say the excesses of your previous uh, economic endeavors. You are rich because somebody else somewhere is poor. And I think Zach is right. Billionaires, he would have no truck with billionaires. He gave almost all of his money away as a matter of course, as a matter of principle. There are, in, in, my, in my lifetime, which is now getting modestly long, in my lifetime, there is no one I have met that has the, the, the sense of heart and care and love of the world and human beings that Ruskin does in his work. And I love and admire many great poets and many great writers, but Ruskin is, is a step above them all. Uh, Gabriel, we have one more slide and it will just be very quick folks. You've all been very patient. This is Count Leo Tolstoy, War and Peace, uh, all the great Tolstoy books. This is his great tribute to Ruskin. Ruskin is one of the most remarkable of men, not only of England and our time, but also of all countries and all times. He is one of those men who thinks with their heart. And so he thinks and says what he himself has seen and felt, and that was true. And what everyone will think and feel in the future. <clears throat> and as my minister likes to say at the end of his ser sermons, may it be so. Thank you again, Jim, for uh, shepherding us through this key text in Ruskin Social Thought. Um, I can think of no better guide to orient us to what really is central to this uh, powerful, uh, but also complex uh, text. And thanks, thank you for all your, your efforts in putting together this series. And we all look forward to the day when your book on Unto This Last, Availing Toward Life, is published and larger and larger audiences have access uh, to your insights into the way in which you enable us, you know, to 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 get into this text, the door that you open uh, into this great work. So, Jim, thank you so much for all you've done. Thank for you us all. These past weeks. You're here. Can I, can I add one tiny postscript? Sure. <laughs> uh, We're still here, Jim. You mentioned how Ruskin was steeped in scripture. Right, I was thinking this now. Uh, and we've been talking a little bit about the rich and the very rich and the obscenely rich. On a scriptural point, there was this fellow whose name was Zacchaeus, right? And he was kind of short of stature. And he uh, ordered to talk to Jesus and see him. He went up in a tree and he, he, he was noted, his presence was noted. And he, he came down and he said, uh, I've given half my money to the poor, or, or was it a pledge? No, uh, I'll give half my money to the poor. Uh, and a lot of his money came by way of taxing those who oughtn't to have been taxed. But it was seen as a creditable thing on his part, giving away half his money. 
And he also said, anybody I've wronged, I'm going to make recompense fourfold, fourfold. So if you'd been ripped off by Zacchaeus, it turns out to be a pretty good thing for you after all, because you'll get <laughs> your money back times four. At any rate, there's hope for the rich. There's hope. That's my postscript. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, the, uh, uh, just to note, the two earlier sessions are already up on our YouTube channel, so you can avail yourself of those. This one will be up shortly. Um, as Eric mentioned earlier, this is the last public event of our fall season. We'll be back again in January with a full slate of programs for the winter and spring seasons, uh, starting off with uh, Damien Searle's lecture on Ruskin and Proust that we're uh, really looking forward to. Um, this is a particularly important lecture. Searles has written a great deal on Proust and Ruskin. Uh, and this is an interesting area that I think is not covered um, as much as it should be, which is to say that this whole kind of school of French Ruskinians who have a very different approach to Ruskin than the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the UK and US world of Ruskin appreciators. So this will be very, very, uh, very interesting uh, uh, talk. Um, upcoming events will be posted on our calendar soon, www.ruskinartclub.org. And we will be publishing the final newsletter of the year of, 2020, of 2021 uh, next month with lots of information on the 2022 season, as well as pertinent articles and the, uh, the newsletter essay. If you haven't yet subscribed to the newsletter, please do so on the website and consider becoming a member of the Ruskin Art Club. Again, thank you for all your support uh, and for all of you who have, uh, who have partaken of these uh, study sessions, a real experiment for us, but one that we're very excited to continue uh, in the future. Gabriel, Fine let me- holiday season to you and to your families. Yes, Jim? Gabriel, yeah, one quick comment at the end here um, in terms of thinking through it. This, this has been great fun for me. It's reacquainted me with this wonderful text and I've been delighted to have this chat with a, with a number of you in different places around the country. And thank you so much for your time and being here with us as well. We have not talked in any way substantially enough about the greatness of these four pieces, uh, the, these four essays that Ruskin includes in onto this last. It rewards you constantly if you continue going through it. I want to underscore what I deeply believe that in terms of still our modern world, this is the radical, radical social thought of John Ruskin. It is still radical for us to think about profit being not the amount of money that we make after we have a trade with somebody, but profit being something that allows you to grow stronger and higher uh, than you were before. Real profit is when you finish a Yeats poem and you finally say, oh, I finally get that. I finally get what he's trying to say there. That's profit. What is not profit is the fact that you sold your Yates book and made five bucks on it, uh, given what you paid for it originally some years ago. That is not profit, that is exchange, that, but that is not profit. In any event, Ruskin threatened his, the people of his time. I think Ruskin continues to threaten the people of our time. Uh, next time we do something like this, perhaps we should get a bunch of really dyed in the wool business people involved and hear what they have to say about these essays. Very good. The fine holiday season to all of you and to your families. We yes, will see indeed. you next year. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Jim. Thank you to also to Joseph Thank Rodriguez you. for helping us tonight with the tech tech aspects. And Katrina, yes. Thank indeed. you.